In this lecture, we're going to learn how to calculate the derivative of a function efficiently. In the previous lecture, we had defined what a derivative is, and starting from that definition, we had worked out the derivative of simple functions like x squared, sine x, cosine x, etc. But we need to do more. And it's not always best to start from the definition. We can develop more efficient techniques. And so let's do that. Let's begin by reviewing the meaning of differentiation and of a derivative. Here is a function f that takes an input x, x is a number, and puts out another number f of x. Now, the function f can be used as an input into another machine, which we can call a differentiator, and out comes the derivative of that function, f prime. The function f is differentiable. In all the discussion that will come subsequently, we shall assume that this limit, f prime x, which is the difference between f at two slightly separated points, x plus epsilon and f of x divided by epsilon, that this limit exists. And so we shall assume henceforth that all the functions we encounter are differentiable. Let's move towards differentiating a sum of functions. To begin with, two functions. So here is a function g, another function h. They are given the same input, x, and out comes from g, g of x, and from h, h of x. These are added together over here, and out comes g of x plus h of x, which I have called a new function, p of x. What we need now is the derivative of p of x. In other words, the sum of the two functions. So that's easily done. p prime of x is defined to be p of x plus epsilon minus p of x divided by epsilon. And now let's put in over here g of x plus epsilon plus h of x plus epsilon and subtract it from g and h at the point x. And of course all this needs to be divided by epsilon. Let's slightly rearrange this. It's quite trivial. All we do is separate the g's and the h's and you can see what's coming out of this. It's going to be something that has only g in it, something that has only h in it. And as epsilon becomes smaller and smaller, this becomes g prime of x and that becomes h prime of x by the very definition of the derivative. So what we've shown is that g plus h prime is g prime plus h prime. And this holds for every point x. Another way of writing this is that d by dx of g plus h is the sum of the derivatives dg by dx and dh by dx. So that's pretty trivial. And of course, you can generalize this to as many functions as you like. So if I have one function f1, another function f2, another function f3, and so forth, and I keep going, and I take the derivative of this sum of functions, well, I get the sum of the derivatives, and so forth. So that's pretty easy. Let's move now to a product of functions. So here is the same function or a different function g, another function h. They both get the same input x, 
and out comes g of x over here h of x and the product so these two outputs g of x and h of x are multiplied together to give p of x and now let's take the derivative of the product what that means is we've got to calculate this thing divided by epsilon so the function at two slightly different points and now that's g of x plus epsilon h of x plus epsilon minus g into h divided by epsilon now that looks not very useful so let's try a trick with this let's add and subtract the same number and you'll see immediately why that's such a good idea so i'm going to do the following i'm going to write it i'm going to write the above expression without any change by doing the following i'll subtract g of x into h of x plus epsilon and then add back that same number or that same function into this again and you will see that this is actually a very good idea because now I'm going to write h of x plus epsilon I'm going to take that common between this and this these first two terms and write it in the following way g of x plus epsilon minus g of x divided by epsilon and then the last two terms can be written in the same form but with the h's subtracted at slightly different points and now this thing is going to become the derivative as epsilon becomes smaller and smaller and this is going to be the derivative of h as epsilon becomes smaller and smaller but what about this h of x plus epsilon remember that h is a differentiable function and hence a continuous function and so this becomes h of x g prime of x plus g of x h prime of x in other words what we found is the following that if we take the product g h and differentiate that take the prime of that we get g prime h plus g h prime and now the obvious generalization of that is that if i have something like f g h etc then if you take the derivative of that it's going to be f prime g h plus f g prime h plus f g h prime and you could continue this on for as many functions as you like again some people like to write it in the following way if you write d by dx of h into g you differentiate the first dh by dx write the second one as it is and then write the first one as it is differentiate the second and so forth and of course the generalization of this formula is also obvious as an example let's take x to the power 4 sin x so our rule says that we've got to write the derivative of x to the 4 sin x by differentiating the first writing the second one as it is and writing the first one as it is differentiating the second well we know what the derivative of x to the power 4 is it's 4x cubed sin x is as before and now we know that the derivative of sin x 
is cosine x. So we have x to the 4 cosine of x. And of course, there's no need to simplify this further. You could take x cubed common in these two terms, but that doesn't really matter. And so let's move on to another example. Here we have three terms. There's x squared, sine x, and cosine x. Our rule says we differentiate the first one, 2x, leave the others unchanged, so sine x, cosine x. Then we leave the first one unchanged, differentiate the second one, differentiate the second one, we get cosine x and cosine x. This one appears unchanged. And then finally, what we need to do is leave the first and the second unchanged, differentiate the third one. If you differentiate the third one, you get minus sine x. So you get minus x squared sine x into sine x. And so let's slightly simplify this. This is 2x sine x cosine x plus x squared into, you can see that x squared is common between these, so write it as cos squared x minus sine squared x. And that's good enough. Differentiating the reciprocal of a function or 1 over a function is important, it's needed at times. What that means is that you have a function g, it takes in x and out comes g of x. 1 over g takes x and it puts out 1 over g of x. And now you've got to be careful about one thing. g of x should not be 0 at the point that you are differentiating. So I'll write that over here just to remind you that g of x cannot be 0 at that value of x, that value at which we are finding the derivative. Well, how do you find the derivative anyway? In the usual way, of course, we take 1 over g prime at the point x, which is 1 over g of x plus epsilon minus 1 over g of x divided by epsilon. And if we just simplify this a little bit, that's g of x minus g of x plus epsilon divided by g of x into g of x plus epsilon times epsilon itself. Now, let's write this slightly differently. This is minus, I'm taking the minus sign out. That's g of x plus epsilon minus g of x divided by epsilon. And here I have 1 over g of x and g of x plus epsilon. So I've just rearranged the terms slightly to make them more clear to you. Now this part over here, g of x plus epsilon minus g of x divided by epsilon, this will become the derivative of g at the point x when epsilon becomes smaller and smaller. And so we are always looking at epsilon going to zero. What about over here? Since g is assumed to be a differentiable function and therefore is a continuous function, therefore g of x plus epsilon, this thing over here, is going to get closer and closer to g of x. And so our final result is that we get minus g prime of x divided by g squared of x. Or if you want to write this in the Leibniz notation, d by dx of 1 over g is minus 1 over g squared of x dg by dx. 
Both forms are, of course, exactly the same. Now that we've learned to differentiate the reciprocal of a function, we will calculate the derivative of the ratio of two functions. So let's call them f and g. We give the input x to this machine f over g and out comes f of x over g of x. How does one calculate this derivative? That's very simple actually because f over g, if we differentiate this, well that's really f prime into 1 over g plus f times 1 over g prime. We've learned how to calculate 1 over g prime. So let's write that out. That's f prime 1 over g. And here we have minus f times 1 over g squared into g prime. So finally, here's the result. That's how you do the ratio of two functions. Let's work out a few examples. First of all, this one over here. So this is a ratio of two functions. One is this. We could call that f if we like. And the other is sine of x. The differentiation is then to be done as follows. We differentiate what is over here on top first. And so we get 4x cubed plus 4. We write the second one as it is. And then what we do is we write the first one as it is. x to the 4 plus 4x. And what we need now is the derivative of 1 over sine x. But we've learned how to do that. And so after writing the first one as it is, I'll just take 4 common. So x cubed plus 1 divided by sine x. Slight simplification of the first term. Let's uh, simplify the second one also slightly. So we have x into x cubed plus 4. And this second one differentiates as follows. When we differentiate this thing over here, we need to, first of all, write minus, then 1 over sine of x squared. So you remember that when we had the derivative of 1 over g, we had minus 1 over g squared, and then we have to differentiate sine of x, which is cosine x. And so that's the answer. Of course, we could make it a little bit nicer by taking the minus sign outside over here, but that's fine as it is. Well, let's look now at sine x over cosine x. We've, this is actually even easier than the first one. So the derivative of sine x over cosine x will be, we leave the second one unchanged, we differentiate what's on top, which is cosine x, write the second one unchanged, so cosine x over cosine x, that'll give us 1, and then what we need to do is subtract we leave the first one, sine of x, that's like the function f, unchanged. And then what we need to do is differentiate 1 over cosine of x, sorry, this was a plus, 1 over cosine of x, derivative of that. What do we get? We get 1 from here. When we differentiate cosine of x, then there are going to be two minus signs, and let's keep track of them. So 1 plus sine x, there's, we have to multiply this by minus 1 over cos of x squared, and then differentiate the cosine of x, which gives us minus sine x. 
And so we have two minus signs over here. What we have on top is 1 plus sine squared x. And at the bottom, we have cos squared x. We can simplify this. Take uh, the common denominator, which is cos squared x. On the top, we'll get cos squared x plus sine squared x. But you know that that's equal to 1. And so the result is 1 over cosine squared x. We'll now learn to differentiate a function of a function. What that means is, given a number x that's fed into a machine called g, or a function g, out comes the number g of x, which becomes the input to the function h, and out comes this number h of g of x. We could call this function h of g of x, p of x. Or if you remember our earlier notation, we call p as h composed with g. So, what we really need to do is to find the derivative of the function p. So, there's one machine that takes the place of both of these two machines, and that machine is called p. Therefore, we need p prime of x, which is defined in the usual way. It's p of x plus epsilon minus p of x divided by epsilon. No surprises over there. And now, this thing is, of course, what we have above, h of g of x plus epsilon minus h of g of x divided by epsilon. Well, what am I going to do with this? After all, this is h at the point g of x plus epsilon. Now, we need to simplify this, or rather we need to find an expression for that derivative. And there's a simple trick that one can use. What I'm going to do is multiply and divide by the same number. That number I'm going to choose as g of x plus epsilon minus g of x divided by the same number, g of x plus epsilon minus g of x. I'm going to slightly rearrange this. This is to be written as h of g of x plus epsilon minus h of g of x as before. But now I'm going to take this over here. So g of x plus epsilon minus g of x. And of course here I'm going to get g of x plus epsilon minus g of x. I'm just rewriting that divided by epsilon. I've taken this epsilon over here. What was the advantage of that? Well, certainly over here, you can see the derivative of g coming out. And here, you also see a derivative of h coming out. Now here, instead of the number x plus epsilon, I have the number g of x plus epsilon. And here, instead of the number x, I have the number g of x. So this is really just h prime at g of x. And write this as g prime of x. So that's the result that we've arrived at, a very important result. It says that take the derivative of both h and of g, just multiply them together, but the derivative of h is at the point g of x, whereas the derivative of g is at the point x. Or if you want to write this in the usual Leibniz notation, d by dx of h of g of x is dh by dg at the point g of x multiplied by dg dg by dx. 
Don't think of this as DG's cancelling, but uh, still it's a nice way of remembering that. The generalization of what we've just learned is called the chain rule. So if I have functions f, g, h, here is x, out comes f of x, here is g, which takes in input f of x, and so what comes out is g of f of x, and then that goes as input into h, and from there comes h of g of f of x, and you can see that this can become a chain as long as you want. Another way of looking at this is that we have a single function, a single machine, which is H composed with G composed with F, starting from here. So H, G, F. That's the order in which it is to be written. Then the result is perfectly obvious. P prime that is to say the derivative of h composed with g composed with f is going to be h prime into g prime into f prime. So you differentiate all of these h prime, g prime, f prime. But they are, the derivatives are to be found at different places. It's clear what those are. They should be h prime at g of f of x. And this derivative, that is to say g prime, is to be evaluated at f of x. And f prime, of course, is to be evaluated at x itself. Now you can imagine that if I had four functions or ten functions, you would do this in exactly the same way. So again, you just take the product of the derivatives, the derivative of h, of g, of f, but you evaluate them at different points. Their arguments are different. Let's take as example the following. Sine of x squared. By our rule, we first differentiate sine, and that gives us cosine. Where is it to be evaluated at? At x squared. Then the next thing that we do is we differentiate x squared. And so obviously the result is, from here is 2x, so we get 2x cosine of x squared. That's the result of differentiating sine of x squared. So that was easy enough. Let's go to another example. Now I have cosine of sine of x squared. Let's begin by first differentiating cosine of x. When you differentiate cosine, you get sine. Where is it to be evaluated at? Sine of x squared. So sine of x squared. Then we come to differentiating sine. So sine has to be differentiated at which argument? At x squared, of course. Okay. And finally, we've got to differentiate x squared. x squared, when differentiated, will give us 2x. And so our final result is 2x sine of sine of x squared. You see, I'm not putting brackets around x squared. It's assumed that x squared is the argument of sine. And then again, I have sine of x squared, and that's it. Now, notice over here that sine of x squared appears separately. Here, sine of x squared is the argument of sine. We can get more complicated examples. And so just for practice, let's do a couple more. From here, we get the, de the derivative of sine is cosine. Where is it to be evaluated? At here. So it's to be evaluated at cosine of sine of x squared. And just remember to 
close off all the brackets. You've got to have two over here and two over here. Next thing, we differentiate cosine. When we differentiate cosine, we get minus sine. So let me put a minus over here. Here's a sine. And now it's to be evaluated at sine of x squared. So the sine is at sine of x squared. Finally, or finally before last, we have to differentiate sine of x, which gives us a cosine of x. So here's cosine of x squared. And then at the very end, we've got to differentiate x squared. So that gives us, at the end of it all, minus 2x cosine of cosine of sine x squared. And here, sine of sine of x squared. So I'm just copying things over just to make them look nicer. And that's it. That was easy enough. As our final example, let's take this expression over here. Differentiate the sine first. You get cosine. Cosine at which argument? Obviously, at cosine of 1 over x cubed plus sine 3x. Then, we need the derivative of cosine. The derivative of cosine is minus sine. So I'm going to put a minus over here. And here's a sine. And this sine is of argument 1 over x cubed plus sine 3x. And then finally, we need the derivative of what's over here. In other words, 1 over x cubed plus sine 3x. We have to differentiate this. Well, how do we differentiate this? You remember that we had learned how to differentiate 1 over a function or the reciprocal of a function. And so let's use that now. When we differentiate the reciprocal, we get minus 1 over the square of this function. And so that minus and this minus are going to give, up, give us a plus. Therefore, we have 1 over x cubed plus sine 3x squared. We need to differentiate now what's over here, which is 3x squared. And now when we differentiate sine of 3x, we're going to get 3 cosine 3x. So that's going to be over here. And then the rest we're going to write just as before. So cosine of cosine of 1 over x cubed plus sine 3x. And this last term over here sine of 1 over x cubed plus sine 3x. So you see, this is perfectly routine, normal. This is just a matter of applying rules. To repeat those rules, you just differentiate all the functions that you have, sine, cosine, the reciprocal, and then just um, evaluate them at their separate arguments, at the arguments that they ought to be at. Now that we have these techniques, the question is what do you do with all these derivatives? For that we need applications and that will be done in the next lecture.